What's going on, my people? This is your host, Blanc Eden with Black Trending News. So tonight we're going to be talking about a missing persons case. And we're going to touch a little bit on something called missing white women's syndrome, which is a term used by social scientists. This case is a fine example of how missing white women's syndrome works. There, unfortunately, uh, before I get into it, I do want to say that this person who was a trans woman, Sage Smith, went missing on November 20th, 2012. So... Seven and a half years, about seven and a half years ago, this trans woman, and was just coming out on social media and to her family shortly before she was missing, she was serious about her transition and she disappeared. It says here that Sage's mother confirmed that it was extremely out of character for Sage's phone to go to voicemail and for her not to have been in touch with family or friends for 36 hours. Detectives also spoke to the friend who confirmed she had seen Sage walking west on Main Street just after 6.30 on November 20th that the two had stopped to talk real quick and that Sage had said she was, quote, going to meet a man. There's a lot to this story. I'm going to try to make it short. I do want to talk about the family Uh, I saw an interview with the family, very touching, very sad story, how uh, this mother's child is still missing. They have declared her murdered. A lot of websites have declared her murdered. Uh, Even the mother has said herself that she really believes that Sage is no longer with us, but she wants closure. She wants to know what happened. The search for Sage Smith, now 27, has police looking for this young man, Eric McFadden, who would now be 28. Police believe he was the one meeting Smith that cold night in November. They say he, too, has now disappeared, and they're calling him a person of interest. We have made a plea today to uh, find Eric McFadden. We would like to talk to him. He has information vital to this case. Um, As you can see, we have a family that's hurting, um, and we hope he sees this and he does the right thing. The fact remains that my child is missing, and that to me all is all that matters. Um, I am in a, a situation where I cannot grieve, and I just need closure. The family says they can't agree on whether they should hold out hope that Smith is still alive, but they tell us that anyone seeing this photo should know this is a person who is terribly missed and deeply loved. You could just be watching something on TV and you could wish, like, wish he would just walk in right now. Personally, I feel that, um, that he's no longer with me. Because there's no way, there's no way that he would not be here. Let's talk about missing white women syndrome. So this is when media commentators refer to extensive media coverage, especially on TV, of missing person cases involving young white upper middle class women or girls. The term is used to describe the Western media's undue focus on upper middle class white women who disappear with the degree of coverage they receive being compared to cases of missing women of color, women of lower social classes, and missing men or boys. And in this case, it is also gender related because the family truly believes in their spirit that this case was not given any clout whatsoever because they were poor, they were black, and they lived in a very, um, I guess, poor neighborhood in Virginia. And they mentioned in the interview, which I'm going to play, that there was a a white woman, Hannah Graham, that went missing at the time. They just couldn't believe how much media coverage Hannah Graham got. Uh, Even one of the girls, the sister says, they were coming into my job looking for her. I mean, they were really clearing the area for this girl. And her sister, Sage, did not get any coverage. Sage Smith's family says they do not diminish in any way the depth of this tragedy. 
They tell us a new police detective assigned to their case has worked hard to keep them updated on the investigation. And they don't want this interview to spoil that relationship. We tried to talk with Charlottesville police, but they declined our request for an interview. They did share this on an episode of Disappeared, seen on Investigation Discovery, explaining the difference in the response between the two cases. Why did a thousand media trucks show up for Hannah Graham and only a few for Sage's case? That's a societal problem that we have. A lot of people need to ask those questions, why these cases were treated differently. We also talked with Zakia McKenzie, who runs a foundation that helps meet the medical and legal needs of gay, gender fluid, and trans Virginians, many of them of color. She says she knows all too well the answers to those questions. So I told you what we were talking about with, with missing um, people, and in particular missing people of color, and you know about Sage's story. Yeah. What are your thoughts on all of this? I think it's really strange how um, individuals can just come up missing, and um, especially when we think about trans people of color, mm -hmm. um, because there is so much that's going on in our world right now um, affecting us and all of the murders, but um, it just baffles me how someone can just like disappear, vanish, no trace, no anything. So. The Sage's uh, gender identity, how do you think that works into all of this? People don't understand trans people or gender fluid people. Um, some people have the mentality that, um, you know, we put ourselves in certain situations and these things happen because of who we are. The part that it plays is that they don't prioritize investigating it. I think because of privilege and class. Yes. So what I wanted to do on this episode today was talk a little bit of background about Sage and see what you guys think about what, what might have happened. Because honestly... I don't want to say that she's no longer with us. Um, based on what I've read, it could be a number of things. I don't think necessarily that she's dead. Um, she has a background. How could I put this in the best way here? I'll just read it. That will, um, and then make your own, your own thoughts. So let's get into some clues and some details about the story now although sage struggled in school she did become the first in her family to graduate from high school so that is awesome right she had a big accomplishment she took cosmetology classes she braided hair out of her home and she swept hair at a salon so she was dedicated uh, she was also in foster care and she was re later returned back to her mother, who was subsequently deemed unfit. Now, here is where the story takes a little bit of a dip and a twist. Now, sometimes Sage and her friend Shakira would go to parties that catered to men on the down low. They also hosted parties at the apartment on Harris Street and invited men and other friends over. They had a tight friend crew that also included a person named Aubrey, and three women named Alexis, Tiffany, and Chelsea. Sometimes they hooked up for fun, other times for money. The guys they met came from all walks of life. Many of them were married. If either Sage or Shakira was going to hook up, they would text the other. One time, Shakira recalls a University of Virginia professor arranged for her to come over to his house in a fancy neighborhood and when the man left the room she heard a knock on the window it was sage outside in the bushes watching her to make sure that she was okay so that just gives you a little bit of background on the lifestyle that sage left many people would say it's an exciting lifestyle some people would say it's a very risky lifestyle um i personally believe that her lifestyle led to her missing to me, uh, when you when you delve in that type of world, you could get into some trouble, right? I think so. Now, her friend Shakira did not hold a high school diploma, and getting a job without one wasn't easy. Potential employers seemed nervous when she mentioned that she was trans, and they did not call her back for work. Sage and Aubrey were harassed on the street. They were called slurs, once chased by a crowd. 
Sage's jobs paid minimum wage and neither Miss Cookie, who was her caretaker or her grandmother, nor her dad, Dean, had a lot of cash to spare. So these girls were pretty much working girls. They were working. I think personally that that has a lot to do with what happened. Now, let's get a little more into this. Let's get a little more into this. The story is going to turn up, turn up a little bit. Now, Sage wasn't a stranger to interpersonal troubles. Her Facebook account shows messages from March 2012 in which a friend is telling her to, quote, watch her back. That people on the street had it out for her because she's contacted the wife of a man she hooked up with. Occasionally, Sage also placed casual encounters ads on Craigslist, a practice that Shakira did not approve of. This is how police believe Sage met Eric McFadden. It looks like there was something that happened right the day before that she was the last time that she was seen, which I would like to say is the day that she went missing. That day before, November 19th, it was a Monday and Shakira, it was Shakira's 19th birthday. These girls were very young. Okay, the friends group celebrated Shakira's birthday in style at their apartment, but then a girl came busting through the door wanting to start a fight with one of Sage's friends over a man. The fight led outside. There were cars parked all the way up Sage's street. Then car doors opened and a crowd of people jumped out. So maybe there was a, a jump involved. Um, in the midst of it, Sage ended up fighting with a man named Jamal Smith, an acquaintance whom Sage had been around town with. Things escalated and someone called the police. The police responded at about 11.20 p.m. and Jamel Smith filed a report that Sage damaged his car, but no one was arrested. Shakira said fights were not unheard of in their circle, but that something about this one felt different. Okay, so... Something was obviously going on when you're dealing with men that are on a down low. Maybe some tea gets spilled, some things get out, fights happen, beef happens, hate happens, murder happens. You know what I mean? Um, I, it's really unfortunate. I also want to note that she may have some dealings with the police in the past. This may be her first one that I just read. Or maybe she's had other dealings with the police in the past. So that could also let police go, you know what, well, she's had dealings with the police. It's even more reason for them to kick their feet up and not care. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right. I think they should care just as much as they cared about Hannah Graham's case, who was a missing white woman, uh, that may not have any dealings with the police and maybe seems more innocent, you know, more clean, you know, clean cut. You know, girl next door, let's help her family find her. You know, so that could have had something to do with it. So the next day, Sage's other roommate, Aubrey Carson, said that Sage woke him up from a nap when she left and told him simply that she was off to meet a man. When Aubrey woke again around 8 p.m., the house was dark. He called Sage's phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Aubrey said this was a major red flag and that Sage would charge her phone anywhere. In the morning, Sage was still not back. That was the morning of November 20th. When the phone rang at around 9 a.m., Shakira thought it was Sage calling to apologize to her because of the event that happened at her party, but it was just Aubrey. Shakira told Aubrey to call Miss Cookie, who was Sage's grandmother, who told Aubrey to call the police. Eventually, the police came to the house and talked to them. She told them what she's been saying all along, that Sage would never leave her family right before Thanksgiving and not tell anyone somebody must have taken her. Mm. Aubrey also stated that from the start, it seemed like the police department did not take this very seriously and that they seemed very calm. I could believe that. I can definitely believe that. Um, it says here that detectives began investigating on Thursday, November 22nd, Thanksgiving Day. The case was originally assigned to a detective, Sergeant Mark Brake, who was not returned multiple requests for comment. All right. Now, on Friday... That Friday, 
of that week, Sage has been officially missing for 72 hours. One of the detectives got a hold of Sage's cell phone records, which showed that Sage talked to a friend from Northern Virginia for about 20 minutes on the day of her disappearance. But the last call Sage's phone received was at 6.36 p.m. from an unidentified number. After that call, all activity on Sage's phone stopped. To identify the unknown number, the detectives gave it to Sage's family. Dean posted to his Facebook page, and before long, he received a message from an acquaintance named Yami Ortiz, a trans woman who moved in similar circles as Sage and her friend Shakira. She says, I know that number. That's Eric McFadden. Sage's phone records reveal that the two had been exchanging texts and calls for several weeks before Sage's disappearance and that they had met multiple times for sex and that McFadden may have already given Sage some money in exchange for Sage not outing him to his girlfriend. Now, this is all alleged because this young lady, Yami Ortiz, does not know this for a fact, but she probably has a good idea because she does the same work as the other girls do. Years of living in Charlottesville and being stopped, sometimes seemingly at random, by CPD had left a bitter taste in Dean Smith's mouth, who is Sage's father, and the slow start out of the gate made Dean suspicious. Quote, I felt like they were lying to us on the whole. Dean said, I did my own investigation. So, later Dean learned that McFadden worked at a Sherman Williams paint store and lived in a downtown Charlottesville with his girlfriend. Dean also posted McFadden's picture to Facebook. That really set us back a long way, said the detective Mooney, who believes that Dean posting that picture spooked McFadden into fleeing. If we'd have had a chance to find him without his picture being out there, we might be talking to him instead of looking for him. Now, you can't really blame the family for turning to Facebook because it did turn up some information but perhaps, you know, the father is not a professional investigator. Maybe he wasn't thinking. Maybe he was like, you know what? Maybe somebody will just turn him in. But people just don't do that. I just, I feel like people see something. They don't always say something. Uh, especially when it's a situation like this. Here you have a man who can be outed by his girlfriend. You know, so he's obviously down low. He's secretive. Maybe the people around him are like that. Those chances are slim. Um, I think the police should have acted fast. I don't think that's an excuse for anything. The parents were just trying to do their best to find their daughter. Now, the grandmother, Miss Cookie, says, All their information came from us, also referring to efforts undertaken by Sage's aunt, Tanita Smith, who found McFadden's Facebook profile and being able to access Sage's Facebook and Twitter, began checking them for clues. It began to feel like we were doing their job for them. On Saturday, November 24th, after conducting a search of Sage's neighborhood, the Charlottesville Police Department got another call about a missing person. This time, it was a young woman named Esther Ayini. She said she had not heard from her boyfriend, Eric McFadden, who had been staying in her apartment while she was out of town for Thanksgiving. CPD detectives told Ayani that they were actually already looking for McFadden to question him about his role in Sage's disappearance. McFadden's job confirmed he had not shown up to work in several days with no explanation and no warning. Wow. Crazy. Um, I mean, I think this guy has something to do with it. I mean, what do you think? All these things lead to that. Um, but they still don't have him in custody. <sighs> the family feels like instead of calling people, they should have been getting people in the investigating rooms and interrogating them. On Monday, the CPD officers talked at length with Ayani, which is the girlfriend of Eric, who Eric was trying to hide from, try, trying to hide his little lifestyle from. She had finally gotten a call and emails from McFadden the previous night, Sunday, November 25th. He told Ayani he was in Washington, D.C. and needed money.
She told him that the police wanted to speak to him about Sage Smith and gave him contact information for the detective. When the police entered Ayani's apartment looking for McFadden for Eric, he wasn't there, but they collected McFadden's stuff from her apartment, including his laptop, computer, and clothes. A receipt from CVS showed that he had been in Charlottesville until at least recently that evening, the evening of Thursday, November 22nd, two days after Sage went missing. Now, on Tuesday, November 27th, with Sage missing for a week now, detectives got a call from Eric McFadden himself. Yes, McFadden explained, quote, I was supposed to meet Sage near the Amtrak station that day, but she never showed up and I don't know what happened to her. He was in New York now, he told detectives. Why? Quote, because I've never been to New York before. McFadden responded, Detective Mark Brake told McFadden that he should return to Charlottesville and McFadden hung up. Wow. Wow. Well, I have reason to believe this guy knows exactly what happened. He probably hurt her and killed her because maybe she was looking for money. And I mean, I'm just speculating. I don't know. But this guy is... um. He sounds like he's on the run. Now, the next day, Esther Ayani, who's the girlfriend, told police that McFadden was taking a bus to Charlottesville, arriving the next evening, and that he expected to be picked up by the police. The police affidavit reads, Brake reasonably assumed, based on the email communication, that McFadden would be speaking with him at that time to explain his absence from Charlottesville and his relationship with Sage Smith. But that's not how it turned out. On Friday, November 30th, while coming back from a visit to a trash expert that helped them determine that the dumpsters behind McFadden's apartment went to a landfill some 60 miles away in Henrico County near Richmond, detectives heard again from Esther Ayani. McFadden was going to run. Quote, I'm heading out. McFadden wrote to Ayani in an email on November 30th. This is what happened. I never did anything sexual with that guy and he was blackmailing me. He wanted me to give him money, not to lie from saying we did and I did and he agreed to stop and then the next time he hit me up for money, I said no. We did not meet up but he had a lot of enemies. Me and him were walking and some people showed up and I kept walking, not looking back. Wow. Okay. In other words, McFadden did in fact meet up with Sage. Police obtained warrants from McFadden's computer, email accounts, cell phone apps, Twitter, and bank records. Another email to Ayani in May of 2018 from an untraceable email address is the last anyone has heard from Eric McFadden. That December, police made two more efforts to find Sage. (sighs) Eventually, they got a dive team. They're searching ponds. They're using sniffing dogs, rescue dogs to try to find this girl. (sighs) Now, it's very possible that this man is innocent. Um, He said somebody, you know, listen, you guys let me know what you think in the comment section. Keep these uh, this family in your thoughts. They seem like really nice people. They didn't deserve it. Um, But Sage was living a risky lifestyle. I think that no matter what type of lifestyle you're living, if you're missing and something, your life may be in danger, you deserve to be looked for. You deserve the same rights as a Hannah Graham. Have a good night and thank you for listening.